everybody, I'm Sarah and I'm a recorder pair. First of all, thank you to everybody who watched my last video on Happy Birthday Team Recorder. Uh, you seem to really like the video and I did too. And I was actually really happy with the medley that came out of that. And I used it in a couple of concerts at the weekend and it was a big hit. So thank you to you for providing me with a new repertoire piece. Another exciting announcement. As of this month, I have been really happy to join the editorial team at Bloekflautis magazine, which is the recorder magazine of the Netherlands and Belgium. It is in Dutch. There are three editions every year and it's great. There are articles, interviews, reviews. There is sheet music with uh, every single edition. In the last one, I wrote an article on how to warm up at the start of a lesson. So if you are a teacher, there are a lot of practical warm-up exercises. So, yes, look flautist. In today's video, I'm going to be doing something completely new, and that is um, explaining how to practice a specific piece. And the piece we are going to be tackling today is my personal all-time favourite piece, and I personally think it is the best piece of contemporary music written for the recorder. It is Jesty by Luciano Berio. This year is very special. Jesty is 50 years old. It was composed in 1966. And actually this past weekend there was a big festival specifically for this piece in Amsterdam. And the festival was organised by Jorge Isaac, who was my previous teacher. And it was amazing. There were legends of the recorder, such as Walter von Hauer and Case Buche. They were there too, giving masterclasses, concerts, there was so much, and they were also giving their first-hand accounts of how it was to uh, work with this piece in the 60s and to work with Franz Bruchen, who was the recorder player it was composed for. Whew. This was really one of the first real contemporary pieces and Jesty just blew apart the recorder world. It pushed the recorder boundaries far into outer space and really set our instrument on the map for composers and other instrumentalists. So the importance of this piece cannot be overstated. Um, and aside from that, it is just a masterpiece. You can play it either on the alto or the tenor, it says uh, both in the score. And at the end of this video, I will give a performance of it here, unedited. <laughs> Basically what this piece does is it deals with the three elements of recorder playing. The fingers, the tongue, and your air. And it separates them, it makes them completely independent of each other. In the first section, your fingers, tongue and air are completely independent. This means that every time you perform it, you will get a different result. And that is really exciting. In the second section of the piece, the fingers, tongue and air start coming together more, gradually coming together. And by the third and final section, you, are, you have finally coordinated the three of them again. But not to worry, at the end it all fragments again. So in just a few minutes, Berio manages to completely dismantle our instrument, put it back together again and explode it in the process. And it's also quite a humorous piece. Um, apparently Franz Bruchen was a smoker and there are a couple of moments in the piece where the performer has to go <laughs> It uses graphic notation, which is using drawings or symbols to represent music other than regular music notes. And you can see that the first page, what are the fingers doing? Hmm. Wow, that thing is the tongue and that's going a bit crazy. The second page, okay, great, the fingers have joined in with the craziness. And the third page, ah, some real music notes. But yes, they look quite hard. Okay, so say you want to play Jesty, where do you begin? Let's start with the first section. The fingers, what they do here is repeat a pattern over and over and over again. And you're actually free to make up your own pattern. Mine is... I chose this because the seven notes makes it irregular. 
and I've chosen a mixture of high and low fingerings and also a lot of forked fingerings because that later is going to give some real high overtones. So your first step is to make up your repeated finger pattern and practice it and practice it until it is completely automatic. Try doing it and talking at the same time. <laughs> I like this one because I can also hear my fingers. So during the whole first section, that's what your fingers are doing, repeating, repeating. And the tongue is interjecting with all different kinds of sounds. The score does provide a key, but in short, the black blobs are sounds produced by the instrument and by your tongue. And the white blobs are sounds produced by your voice. And sometimes these do mix together. And the higher a blob is on the stave, the higher it should sound. With the tongue, you achieve this with the strength of your tongue. Now, the tricky thing is your tongue and your air have been completely separated. So you can't get a higher note by blowing more. You have to do it with the tongue muscle alone. So your first step as a player is to close your throat. Go to say I and close it. And while your throat is closed, experiment with making your tongue do a very hard and a very soft articulation. And these are the tools you're going to use for making the sounds here. And there are other symbols. There are some lines that means a flutter tongue. And a T, which means a flutter throat. And uh, an inhalation. What Berio has done is split the score into kind of bars. And each bar is three seconds long. Now, this is spatial notation. That means that the distance between the notes is really important. That gives you the rhythm. Uh, this means you have to be very exact. This isn't a piece that you should be bullshitting or improvising. So you're looking at the distance between the notes to see when each one should happen. But actually, when you come to perform this, you should have all of these rhythms that you've figured out. You should have them memorized. For example, the first bar, I always do da, 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 da then it has a bit of a, a movement, a swinging feeling, but it's still accurate, spatially speaking. So let's take one bar, figure out the sounds, and repeat it. So bar one, we have a very short low tongue sound, a very short middle tongue sound, a soft flutter tongue, and another soft tongue sound. So we have And like this, you are gonna go through that entire section. And after a while, the material gets very, very dense, but really take your time, pick it apart, bar by bar, and really memorize each bar before you start putting them together. Then we have the whole matter of dynamics. And in this case, what is the dynamics? It is how much you are blowing. The dynamics is given on a scale from one to seven, one being almost nothing. You're almost not breathing at all. And seven being so hard, you are gonna explode your recorder and explode your brain in the process. And I mean it here. We are not talking the classical range of dynamics. If you wanna play this piece, you've gotta go for it. So imagine you've practiced your finger pattern till it's automatic. You've practiced the tongue and the voice separately. Let's first try and put the fingers and the tongue together. And then we're gonna try and add the dynamics on top. The key to this piece, I feel, is doing it step by step. My tip with the first section, one is that take your voice to extremes as well. If there's a part where it says to do a low voice, don't just do do and high. With this, with Jesty, it looks very, very dense, and it is, but the silences are so important. This is also something that I try and work on in my own play. Really, whenever there's a tiny bit of space in the score, take that moment, take that silence. It can create some tension, it can create some rest. Whatever you do with it, the silences are really powerful. 
Okay, the second section. Until now, the fingers have just been doing their own automatic thing, but now they are gradually going to start following the line of the articulation. Um, and in the second section, the voice also drops out after a couple of bars because you've got enough to be going on with with your fingers. For the tongue, you are going to tackle that much in the same way as you do the first section. Really taking your time because this is dense until it's really in your system. And for the tongue, don't be afraid to mix different articulations. I mix and to make it a bit harder. The fingers. For the fingers, you are given a stave with four lines instead of five. And at the beginning, it says that the bottom line roughly corresponds to the F, all holes closed. The second line roughly corresponds to a G. The third line roughly corresponds to an E flat. And the top line roughly corresponds to, is that a C? So basically they've given a rough idea of where it should be. And as you can see, all these dots are connected. That means you are constantly doing a glissando. So your fingers are glissandoing between those notes. And as your fingers do that, your tongue is articulating. So again, it's gonna be quite indeterminate because your fingers might not always be in exactly the same place. I basically worked out where there's a blob, that's a destination point, and I worked out what that note was. And then I kind of used that to map out where I will be in terms of notes. Here I'm at F sharp, I hear I'm at a B, I hear I'm at the D, I hear I'm at the A flat, and that gives my fingers some points to aim towards. And again, practice the tongue part until it is solid, practice the finger part until it is solid, and then try and put it together. And this will take time and concentration. I found this section so exhausting to practice, but it's really good to do it very uh, detailed from the start. What we don't want this with this piece is that it all ends up being high and we want to hear as much richness of sound as possible. Every tiny little gesture, try and practice that in a hundred different ways, all the different rich possibilities and uh, then you've got lots of options that you can choose from. That was one of Walter von Hauer's tips this weekend. Um, then we come to the last section, which is actual notes. We have bars, we have a tempo indication, so do be strict with the rhythm. Get your metronome, put it on 72. we have another little gem of a joke. Uh, Berio apparently asked Franz Bruchen what is the worst note and what is the most beautiful note on the recorder and Franz Bruchen said the worst note was the high C sharp and he found the most beautiful note to be the high D sharp. So in the piece <laughs> Berio makes you hold a high C sharp for a really long time and then you can go to the D sharp, but then he cuts it off again. Then at the very end, we get the fragmentation. This is everything that in those four minutes you have worked so hard to bring together, it all just fragments at the end. And that is so beautiful. I have no idea if you could follow any of this or if any of this was useful. My advice seems to have just been, take it slow. I can tell you the first time I ever performed this piece, I was so nervous, so nervous. And I started playing and I immediately drooled, like Whoa. And I remember thinking, oh shit, <laughs> I have to really go for it now. And to cover up my embarrassment of drooling on stage, I just went crazy and gave the most crazy performance of this piece I possibly could. And it was great. 
Um, so since then, I've al I've always p interpreted it quite intense and crazy. Not everyone does. That's absolutely fine. That's the beauty of this piece. You can in interpret it in a hundred different ways. Um, but whatever you do, go for it. Jesse by Luciano Berrio, played by me in my house.
I breathe in my hair and my nose is running. Thank you so much for watching. As usual, you can subscribe to my channel by clicking down here. And I am gonna point you to my video on flutter tongue because I think that is important for plain Jessie. So my video on flutter tongue is up here. Have a very nice day. See you next week.